But before we dive into that, I just need you to re-memorize this. I think I introduced you to, uh, to uh, the concept here during our first lecture, but just in case if you're not, if you don't remember. So I have the distance between two points. Of course, this is something easy. Just telling you again, the notation is the double vertical bracket. I'm going to use that kind of notation because uh, I'm more into mathematics. But the formal way of doing this is by using the vertical bar, okay? Uh, the double vertical bar. So let's say if I want to determine the distance between R sub one and R sub two, I have two position. I have two position R sub one and R sub two here. Let's say my position here is R sub one, and then uh, your position is behind that R sub two. So uh, so I have my x y z, and then you have your x y z as well. So how do you determine the distance between the two points using my x y z and your x y z? So this is uh, normally we call this as the norm. Okay, the norm. Let's have a look at the nabla operator. The, the symbol here is known as nabla, the inverted triangle. But normally, uh, some, some mathematicians, they call it as the graph of f. So let's say you have a function which is differentia differentiatable. When I mentioned about a function which is differentiatable, it means that the dy dx of that function is well defined. It is not uh, equal to infinity and whatsoever. So maybe at the moment it is not relevant to you, but maybe later when you go through the higher level mathematics, higher level physics, you will encounter that situation. So we have to get rid of that undefined situation. Let's say if the gradient of a function x is equal to positive, positive infinity. For example, I'm giving you an example. The gradient of a delta function. Delta function is equals to infinity at x equals to zero. So the gradient at that point is undefined. So we are not going to use the delta function here. Just the gradient is undefined. Okay, just remember what you have learned during your form four and form five. Um, you have learned the gradient of a function. And then, um, of course, that is for one dimensional. So you just need to extend the idea into the gradient of a three dimensional space. Let's say you have a ravine. Ravine is, uh, you know, like a cliff, or if you go to the uh, terrain. So you have the surface area, I mean, the surface of the terrain is three dimensional, all right? Three dimensional. So the gradient of that terrain is three-dimensional as well. It is something that you have learned, dy dx, dx over dx. So that is the gradient in one dimension. But now we are considering three directions. We can also uh, extend this to n dimension, n dimensional uh, situation. Uh, so that's the idea. So I have my fancy uh, symbol here, which is the del. So this is nabla. Maybe you need to write it down, nabla, n-a-b-l-e, nabla. And then here is the del. Del is the operator for partial differentiation. So I'm going to give you some example here. So let me show you an example. Just in case if you don't, still don't know how to evaluate the differential partial differentiation. Let's say if I have my f as a function of x and y. Okay, f as a function of x and y is given by x squared sine of y. So this is my x squared sine yeah. of y. And then the sine function here applies to y, okay? So if you want to evaluate the gradient of f of the function here, uh, meaning to say you've, you need to first evaluate the f, del f over del x. So this is also equivalent in terms of the notation. You can also write it this way. This is the shorthand notation. This is the shorthand notation. Del sub x f, okay? Which is also equal to you. To evaluate this, it, it means that you have to assume that your y is a constant. You just put aside your y. Um, you just uh, assume that this as a constant. So the sign of a constant itself is a constant as well. Am I right? So you are assuming this as a constant. So meaning to say you have 2x, right? You differentiate this and then sign of y like that. And then we have another one, which is partial uh, with respect to y partial derivative with respect to y. So of course we can write this as partial of partial of y f, which is equal to the differentiate sign, you will get for sine of y. For this particular case, you assume x as a constant, okay? Because you are doing the partial derivative with respect to y instead of x. So now you assume x as a constant, so x squared cosine of y. Okay, once you have got the two guys here, so of course the gradient, I mean the n-dimensional gradient is a vector, okay? It is a vector. And then you will discover that I should have put the arrow on top of the nabla operator because at the end of the day, the gradient itself is a vector. So I have 
2x sine of y in the i direction, and then x squared cosine of y in the y direction or j. Yeah. If you have three dimensions, then you'll have another one, which is k. So it's up to you. You can use whatever notation that you have. For example, if you look at the gradient of, of this lecture hall, it is a plane, am I right? So if you throw the ball, regardless of the, sh um, I mean, the ball will always fall down towards the cliff, I mean, towards I mean, uh, the slanted surface. You see, I'm saying uh, over there, then I throw the ball, so the ball will tend to move towards down here. So it tends to go towards the lowest potential energy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Because the potential energy over there is higher than the potential energy here because we have the gravity. So this, this idea is basically the same like the uh, potential. So instead of having the ball, you replace the ball with the test charge, okay? Test charge, okay? Not the source charge. The source charge is the reason why we have the electric field. It is just like the Earth is the reason why we have the gravity. Now let's uh, talk about the electric potential energy, okay? Just remember that we have a point charge and then the, the, the electric field, the point charge itself is pointing radially outwards. Okay? Uh, let's say if the charge is positive, so the electric field is pointing outwards. I will show you the reason why we have the equation 2 and equation 3. But of course, equation 2 is something that you have learned in your uh, foundation, in your matriculation. So it is basically work is equal to F times S. If your course is a linear one, and if your distance is a linear distance, then you can use a simple equation. But let's say if your, your distance okay, is a curve, so you have to use calculus to do that. So now I need you to imagine we have a, we have a positive charge here at the center. So I'm going to draw the uh, P lines. So I'm going to draw the P line at the center here. So this is my positive charge. So the field line is going radially outwards. Okay, this is the source charge, okay? This guy is the reason why we have the electric field. Let's say if I have a point charge over here, uh, red colored. I have a point charge and then I'm going to use this particular point charge as my test charge, okay? And then let's say if I use my hand and then I pick the negative charge here, so let's say if it is the positive charge to make it easy. Then I take the positive charge, the positive test charge, and then I move it towards this direction. So meaning to say I will feel the, uh, uh, the force exerted by the electric field towards me, right? So I have to counter the force by the electric field. I have to push the, the, the test charge against the electric field, okay? So meaning to say I am doing some work in order to move that charge from here to here. Let's say this is point A and then I'm moving the positive charge to point B. But as you know, the source charge will always repel with the test charge, right? Because test charge is a positive charge. So meaning to say I have to do something to move it. I have to exert some additional force so that I can move the guy here to the point here. So meaning to say I've done the work. Okay? Let's say if I bring the point here, the test charge here to this point. And the distance from here to here, to the distance from here to here, um, they are the same. Did I do any work? I don't think so. Because you know, the force here and the force here will be the same. Because the distance, because the distance between the positive charge and the test charge, uh, the, sorry, the distance between the source and the test charge, uh, it is the same with this one. This, this, the distance from here to here and the distance from here to here, they are the same. So meaning to say the force will be equal. Force at here and the force at here will be equal. So I'm not doing any work. Even though it seems that like I'm moving something, but I am but I am not opposing any force. So if we have if we have the equation, uh, the integral of f ds, okay? So along uh, path, uh, let's say this is path alpha, this is path beta. So along path a alpha, sorry. Along path alpha, the force, the net force is zero because, because I'm not opposing any uh, force. Okay, so the, the force is a zero vector. So if I dot with the df, so it will lead to zero dual. Okay, even though we have a vector here and we have a vector here, that's why in the integral um, notation here we have the dot sign. So vector dot with a vector is a scalar value. So this will be a scalar value. But if I use path beta, beta, then I'm opposed, 
I mean, the, the vector f is a non-zero vector. It's not a, it's not a, a zero vector. So my f dot ds will be greater than zero. Okay? It will be greater than zero, meaning, meaning to say um, it will not be zero. We have to evaluate the integral. But the idea is that we are not talking about the work done by us. We are more interested in understanding the electric field itself. So rather than knowing uh, the work done by me, we need to know the work done by the electric field to oppose us. Okay? Because, uh, the, I mean, the physicists are not interested with the test charge. We are interested with the property of the electric field. So um, we have the force done by us to move the test charge from point A to point B, which is given by F, okay? We are assuming that, okay, towards this direction. But the electric field is applying, I mean, a force which is opposed to us. So we have negative F sub E. So meaning to say the force exerted by the electric field is oppo opposing us. So that's why I have the negative sign here, okay? Let's say if I'm pushing towards this negative I direction, so the electric field will be towards this direction. Of course, you have a question. Let's say, uh, what if the test charge is a negative charge? So I'll talk about that later, okay? So there is an equation where you include the sign of the negative charge, and then that will cancel off with the negative sign here. So it will be, I mean, yeah, mathematics. That's the trick. So um, based on the equation that I've introduced to you before, if you could remember, if we go back to uh, lecture number two slides, there is an equation, uh, F equals to QE. This is something that you have learned in your foundation, if I'm not mistaken. It's just that we are diving into the details rather than using F equals to QE. But now we have to consider the vector property of E, I mean the electric field, and the vector property of um, the force. So we have F equals to QE. Okay, so you, F E. F sub E, the force due to the electric field is given by QE. It is not the force by us. The guy over here is not equal to this one. It is just that it happens to be F equals to minus F sub E for this particular case, okay? Okay, it is just, it is just that it happens to be the force uh, provided by the electric field is opposing us. So uh, just substitute here in here. So you will have negative QE. So you have the equation here. I'm just so I'm talking about um, moving the test charge from here to here. Okay. So the work done, okay, is given by you substitute the negative QE here. Okay. You substitute. So you have your integral along path B negative QE ds. Okay. So you have to choose. Uh, I mean the path beta can be any path. I mean the vector. Because this is a vector, and then this will dot with a vector, and then for some reason the vector dot with a vector, it will also consider the direction of the path. Let's say just now I've mentioned that the force, the net force from here to here is zero because the distances are the same. Um, the, the equation here will also cover that situation. It will automatically cover that situation. I mean, because of the vector, the nature of the vector. So you know that uh, the force is towards this direction, and then the, di the direction are not the same, right? Um, the directions are not the same. Uh, so the electric field direction is towards this direction, and the force is towards this direction. So you do the dot product, you know, the dot product, dot product of A and B will be A, B, cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between them. So you see the angle between the two here is approximately 90 degrees, or maybe if it is towards this direction, um, so you take the cosine of the theta here, it will be approximately zero. So, um, yeah, again, I repeat, yeah, let's say if you are confused. Just now I've mentioned that if we use path A, so path alpha, so we move from here to here, the work done is zero because we are not doing any work to oppose the electric field because, you know, the distance from here to here is the same as the distance from here to here. Am I right? So the force will be the same. The, the force at this point and the force at this point will be the same because the distances are the same from here to here and they are the same. So regardless of your, um, let's say if you use this path, but if you end up with the two different points that have the same force, the net force is equal to zero. Okay? Let's say if I have a, this, this might be something confusing. Let's say if I use a linear, um, I mean, a linear uh, direction of the electric field. Let's say if we have 
another electric field, which is towards this direction. Okay, I hope you can imagine this, okay? So let's say if I have a test charge here, let's say if I have a test charge over here, if I bring my test charge, if I push my test charge towards the vertical direction, then the work done by the electric field to oppose us is zero. Because, I mean, because this is the source, let's say this is the source, positive. So, uh, this is the source that gives the uh, electric field. Um, and then we have this test charge at the positive charge as well. Because the distance from here to here is the same with the distance from here to here. I mean, along the path here, this is path alpha, for example. So the distance from here towards the source is the same. Same goes to this one. So um, the force, the, the net force will be zero. Okay, do you get the idea? The net force is equal to zero. So meaning to say, the guy here, I mean, uh, when I mention about the force, it means the Coulomb force, okay? The Coulomb force. So uh, the force is the same over here. So uh, let's say if I move from here to here, then the work done by the electric field to oppose our movement is zero because we are not changing the distance between the test charge and the source charge. Is it clear enough to you? Okay, because the distance from the test charge here and the charge here, the source charge, is the same. Okay, from here to here will be the same uh, with the distance from here to here. So because my, if you see the locus here, the locus or the path, because the distance is the same. So I am, I mean, the electric field will not do any job to oppose our movement because we are not changing the distance between the two, from here to here, from here to here. Let's say if I have another path which is towards this direction. Okay, then you can see that at t equals to zero, the time equals to zero, and then this is t final. So the, because this is my final position, so as I move towards this point, then you will see that the distance between me and the source is reducing and reducing and reducing. So when the source charge sees this, I mean when the electric field sees this, then it will say, oh, then I have to oppose the movement because the guy is getting closer to me. So just remember the um, symbolic example. So, so um, yeah, then work done is not equal to zero. So if you move from here to here, then the electric field will not do any job, okay? It will not do any work to oppose our movement because the distance, the distances are the same from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. So you are not getting closer to the source. But if you use the path here, or let's say if I have another path, which is towards this direction, then you will see that you are moving from here towards a point which is closer to the source. So yeah, so for that case, the electric field will do some work to oppose our movement. So basically you have the work done. Okay, I need, I need your attention at the moment, okay? This is important. So now we have the work done okay which is given by the force dot with the displacement so i need you to first remember about the displacement let's say if i have a point a i have point a and then moving towards point b then i have my displacement towards this direction or let's say we have another uh, let's say if we assume that the horizontal axis as our reference so maybe we have point a towards point B. And then let's say if we assume that um, the, the direction towards the right hand side as the positive x axis, the positive x direction. So um, the movement from A, point A to point B is given by a positive, positive displacement. So meaning to say your ds is positive. So for this situation, Let's say if the applied force, let's say if I am doing this, so I have a box, okay, I have a box. I need you to, you to understand the basic first. I have a box over here, and then I am pushing my box towards the positive x direction. And then that action caused the box to move from point A to point B. Since we have defined that the positive x direction as a positive value, I mean the positive value of the displacement, then my displacement is given by uh, L. Let's say L is the length from A to B. And it is, it is a positive value because we, is, because we have defined towards the right uh, hand side direction as a positive x. And then my force is positive as well. 
So a positive value dot with a positive value will lead to a positive work done. Positive work done. So I hope that it is clear. So if you take the vector of the force and then you take the um, vector of the displacement, which is L. So I'm going to put the arrow above L. Same goes to F. So you know the angle between them is zero. So cosine of zero is positive one. So I hope you get the idea. So let's say if I have my force towards uh, the reverse direction, but at the end of the day, the box moves uh, in the opposite direction, maybe due to another force that cause that kind of uh, movement, which is in reverse direction. So the work done will be negative because my force is towards the negative direction and the displacement is towards the positive, positive direction. So meaning to say, the force applied towards the box is useless because at the end of the day, the box moves in the opposite direction. Okay, it is moving in the opposite direction, maybe due to the other factors or the other forces, nearby forces. So if we focus at F, meaning to say the force applied is useless. No, so the work done is negative is negative. So you see the cosine of the angle between uh, the force and the displacement is 180 degrees no? so cosine of 180 degrees is minus one so if you look at the plot of cosine it begins with a positive then go uh, towards positive again so here is 90 degrees so here is 180 degrees so i hope you get the idea so uh, for now we let's apply that to the charge situation so what we so we have two point charges so we assume this guy as the source at point um, A, okay? And then we have another point charge over here, which is positive at point B. So uh, you have to consider your direction first. So let's say if we assume that towards the right-hand side as the positive x direction, so it means that, um, let's say, if you apply a force F, so that you are taking the positive point charge towards the source. So you are applying F, you are applying the force upon the positive charge here so that it moves closer towards the positive source. So your displacement is towards this direction because you are bringing this positive charge closer to the source. Am I right? So yes. So uh, then your displacement is towards the negative X direction. So your L will be negative. And then your force is negative as well. So meaning to say you are doing uh, something that is moving along that, that direction of the force. So meaning to say your force is not useless. So, um, so your work done is positive because your F is also towards the negative direction. Right. We assume that towards the left hand side as negative and then towards the positive x direction as, uh, as positive. So now we have both negatives. So if you take the dot product, you take the dot product of F and L, because F now is negative towards the left hand side, uh, and F same goes to F as well. So the resulting is negative uh, multiplied by negative. So it is a positive work done. So, so in, in other words, it is a positive work done if the force is um it's not useless okay so meaning to say it leads to the movement it leads to the intended movement because you are applying the force towards towards this direction okay you are applying the force towards this direction so we are expecting to see the charge here to move from this point to this point am i right so with that being said uh, we have both positive uh, we have both negative directions here then we have the positive work done Let's say if I replace this with the negative charge, okay? If I replace this with a negative charge. And then let's say if I have my, my force towards this direction, which, which is towards the positive x direction, okay? But for some reason, uh, the attraction between the source and the negative charge is greater than my force. You know, the Coulomb force, I mean, the attraction force between uh, the positive and the neg negative charges, 
they attracted more than my force. I mean, stronger than my force. So at the end of the day, the displacement is from this point to this point. Okay. The, the, the work done by me is useless because my intention is to move the negative charge towards the positive, positive x direction. But at the end of the day, it is moving towards the, uh, the negative direction. So meaning to say, uh, my work done is negative because you see the direction of my force and the direction of the displacement, you know, because at the end of the day, the, the negative charge moves towards the positive source, which is opposed uh which is opposing the direction uh, of my force so f dot l so the work done is negative because this guy is positive but this guy is negative so i'm doing a useless job but of course the f here okay the f here should be the net force but now i'm not considering the net force because i i just want you to understand um the intuition here let's say if you are doing a useless job then the work done is negative so that is the right intuitive phrase the work done is positive if you are not doing a useless job but if you are doing doing a useless job then your work done is negative the potential difference of your battery i mean 1.5 volt that is the potential difference but the thing is, we don't know the potential value at the negative terminal of the battery. And we also don't know the, the value of the potential at the positive terminal of the battery. We don't know, but we only know the potential difference. So that's why the potential difference quoted by the company, for example, Energizer battery, uh, 1.5 volts or maybe uh, 9 volts. So that is the potential difference, not the potential. Okay. Again, I repeat, not the potential. So of course, we have the gradient theorem. So I'm not going to dive into the theorem, theorem itself. You're not, we are not going to derive the gradient theorem. But you just, for the time being, you just also, you just, uh, we, just, uh, we just use the form formula here. This is the gradient theorem. So this is the gradient theorem, okay? You re remember, you have the gr gradient of F, and then if you integrate over the path gamma, okay, then you will have F at position 1 minus F at posi position 2. This is almost equivalent to this one, right? It only depends on the endpoint. So let's say now your F is V. If I replace the F with V, you will have the same um, form here. Okay. So if you compare this one with this one, they are basically the same. Uh, you can, we can write in terms of the potential difference. So now we have the F and then we substitute this one. We, uh, we replace V with F. Then we, you will have the equation here. And then finally, you will have the equation here. I mean, the derivation here is not important to you. I will not ask you in the examination. If you, but the thing is, if you ask the reason why you arrive at the equation here, then you have to go through the gradient theorem. So because of gradient theorem, you have the equation here. If you know the potential at any point in the surface, you can also know the electric field of the surface by using the relationship here. So this is the gradient operator. So now, let's say if we have a system of two charges. But the two charges are point charge. So let's say uh, uh, we have a point charge over here and a point charge over here. Of course, you can use Coulomb's law. Okay, so you can use Coulomb's law. But then, because of the definition of the uh, potential is given by the, uh, the energy divided by Q. So now you are actually missing one Q instead of. Uh, so this is for the electric field. You only use one Q. Okay, okay let me re-explain this here. Yeah? So this is the potential energy, okay? I can also write it like this, the vector of R. I mean, this is basically the distance between R1 and R2. So this is the potential energy. So Q1 should be the first charge. Q2 should be the second charge. Let's say if we have Q2 as our source. If Q2 as the source of the electric field, then we can always drop the value of Q. To find the potential because the potential is given by the, the potential energy divided by Q, where Q is the test charge, right? But now let's let's assume that Q1 as the test charge. So um, if you divide by Q1, then you are left with Q2. So because uh, it is the, the only one Q in the formula, then we are not labeling it as Q2. So we just put Q. The Q here, you should put a subscript test charge. Q sub test. So that you'll be able to remember that the Q here is for the test charge. Okay? 
So the last equation, equation 13, okay, equation 13 here, it is due to this uh, equation because of the potential energy. This, uh, the potential energy here is also related to the equation here, this one. So it is the potential, of the potential is given by the potential energy divided by the Q. So which Q? It is the charge of the test charge. The charge of the test charge. So you put Q sub test. Okay? Let's say if you know, um, if you have a test charge and you have a source, and then you know the value of the test charge and you know the value of the source charge. So here you can, you can find out the potential by substituting the charge of the um, the charge of the test charge and then you substitute into Q. So that is the idea. So I need you to highlight on this one as well. Okay, highlight the equation here. If you have a highlighter, you just highlight. Let's say if I have a question um, giving you um, the potential as a function of x, y, and z. Okay, so uh, you can always use the function to find the electric fields by using the gradient operator here. So the gradient operator here is given by this. So it is totally up to you because the limitation here, okay, the limitation here is your ability to evaluate um, the, dif the partial differentiation. So we have two charges, then um, the, you can always calculate the potential energy of the two, of the two charges. Let's say if you have more than two charges, you have to use uh, the same equation about the electric field. You have a three system of charges. Then how you determine the force? Then, I mean, the equation looks the same, right? The equation looks the same. But now, instead of having um, R as the denominator, you actually have, I mean, instead of having R squared, now you have R, just the R. There is no squared here at this, if you look at my cursor here. Normally, for Coulomb's law, you have the uh, R squared. But here you have r to the power of 1. I mean the distance to the power of 1. So uh, the summation here is the combination of them. So it means say we are considering between the two here, and then another two here, and another two here. Of, uh, I mean all possible combination of pairs. Okay, I have one pair over here, this one and this one. I have another pair, this one and this one. I have another pair between this one and this one. So of course the notation here, I've explained to you about the notation here before, i less than j. It is just that, it is a way of telling you in mathematical terms that the summation is over all possible combina uh, combinations of uh, a pair of test charges. Okay, let's say I have one pair, Q1 and Q2. I have another pair, Q1 and Q3. I have another possible pair, which is between Q2 and Q3. So same goes to the potential, uh, to the, to the uh, potential. but instead of having... Um, Two Qs, Qi and Qj, you just need one Q, okay? You just need one Q. So the R here is the point, I mean the position of interest. Let's say you have three charges, okay? So the potential energy of the system is given by the equation here. So you have Qi and Qj, so I have a pair number one, Q1 and Q2. So Qi is equal to Q1 and Qj is equal to Q2 for that pair. And then I have another pair which is between Q1 and Q3. So now Qi equals to Q1, Qj is equals to Q3. And then you divide by the distance between the two, you know, the, 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 the denominator here. And then I have another one, Q2 and Q3. So the summation just now, we have three charges, okay? Three charges, one, two, and three. So the potential is given by Q1, Q2, divided by R12, so you have to multiply with K, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, and then you plus K Q2 Q3 over R23, plus K Q1 Q3 over R13. So this is the potential of, of the three systems, I mean the potential energy, the potential energy U, not the potential. So the potential energy of the system is given by the equation here. So this is the potential energy of the system. Okay, now let's say if I have a point of interest. I want to know the potential at this point. Let's say if I were to put a test charge at this point. So what is the potential at this particular point? 
Okay, if I have a positive test charge and then I put it here, then what is the potential? So the potential is given by the equation here, okay, given by the equation here, the last one. So instead of having R with a subscript, the R here is the position of interest. Let's say this is the position of interest. I would like to know the potential at this particular point. This is not a test charge, okay? This is a position, okay? This is not a test charge. The position here um, impose that, let's say if I were to place a test charge at this position, so the potential, the potential of the system is given by K. So this is your R, okay? This is your R1, sorry, R1, R3, and then this is R2. So the, you have the first term as the distance between the, uh, the, the charge here and the point here. So you have R1. So we have Q1 over R1 plus K Q2 over R2. So R2 is given by the distance from this point to this point. This is R2. Plus K Q3 over R3, which is the distance from here to here. Okay, so this is it. And then we move into the continuous body. So of course, we have the same form of equation like the previous one. But except that I have replaced the summation term with the integral sign. So basically, this is your k, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then you have dq over r. So you have to assume that um, you are dividing the body into multiple uh, infinitesimally small boxes. So that is the idea. So you have to do the integral over the distance. Okay, You have to do the uh, integral over the distance from the inf infinitesimal uh, charge towards the point of interest. So I hope that this is clear. I'll show you the example after this. So let's say if we have a ring, okay? We have a ring like you put on your finger. So you have your ring like this. So the size of the ring is very, very small, but still you have the infinitesimal size, okay? Let's see if I draw another one. Let's see if I draw another one like that, okay? You know the size of the ring? I mean, the, the circumference of the ring is big, but the thickness of the ring is very, very small. So such that I have my width of the ring or the, the thickness of the ring, I will set that as dA. So A is the radius of the ring. A is the radius of the ring. So now you have the radius of the ring. And then you have a line extending from here, okay? And then this is your point of interest, point P, okay? Your point of interest. And then the distance from the, ce the center of the ring towards point P is given by X. Okay, so now what, the question is, what will be the potential at point P? What? is the value of V at point P. So of course you have to use the equation here. You have to use the equation here because the ring itself is a continuous body. It is a collection of uh, an infinite number of point charges. Okay, a collection of uh, infinite number of point charges. Okay, so that's it. So meaning to say, you can always divide the ring into a small um, infinit infinitesimal volume. Okay. So let's say if the charge density of the ring is L, so, uh, sorry, lambda, I'm using lambda because the ring itself can be assumed as a line, a curved line. You can, you can always transform a line and then you transform into a ring, right? Like that. So that is the idea. So the potential at point P is given by K, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then you take the integral of dq over r. But this time, you don't have to put the r cap because uh, potential is not a vector. Okay? Potential is not, it's not a vector. So the electric field is a vector. So you, uh, when you have the exact form of equation for the electric field, so here for the electric field, instead of having r uh, to the power of 1, you should take r to the power of 2. Okay? And then you have to put the R cap if assuming that you are evaluating the electric field. Okay. Now we are we are evaluating 
uh, the electric potential, so I don't have to put R over here. Okay, so now you know that my dq will be lambda multiplied with the small section here. Let's say if I have a circle here, and then if I zoom this section, then you will have this one, okay? So, so the entire round here, the entire revolution here is, is, is the circumference, okay? But now if I take a small section, so that will be ds, a small section of uh, the circumference, the small section of this ring is ds, okay? So ds is the infinitesimal length from here to here, okay? So, of course, your charge, dq, so uh, you know that this particular portion will contribute to a small amount of charge, which is dq. So you will say dq equals to lambda ds. But of course, as a mathemati mathematician, as well as a physicist, you don't prefer evaluate your integral using the circumference ds. So what you do, you have to change the variable into uh, dA, okay? dA. So um, uh, the idea is that, not dA, uh, yeah, of course, ds. My apologies, okay? So ds, so you don't have to uh, change the variable ds, so you know that uh, your dq is equal to lambda ds, the small section here, and then you substitute here. You substitute into the equation here, then you are left with the integral of lambda ds. Lambda ds over r. Okay. So S is the infinitesimal length of the circumference, okay? Because now your radius A is fixed. It is a constant because the ring stays there without changing its form, right? So it is the size of the radius is A. And then the distance between the center towards point P is also a constant, which is X. But the thing is you have to evaluate your R. So where is your R? Your R it should be extending from this point. Let's say if I choose this particular uh, DQ, then I extend the distance between dq towards point P. And then my r is given by the length from here to here. Let's say if I select my dq over here, then I extend my line from here to here towards point P. Or from point P towards dq. So here is your dq. So this is also r. So the value of r will be a constant regardless of the position of dq on the ring. Regardless of the position on the ring, the value of R will kept constant. So, but the thing is, your R, if you use Pythagoras theorem, your R is given by the square root of x squared plus a squared. Am I right? Because you are trying to evaluate the hypotenuse. So you have a and then you have x. So you take x squared plus a squared and then you take the square root. Okay. How do you evaluate the integral? Even though it, it looks um, complicated, but the thing is, lambda over the square root of x squared plus a squared uh, is a constant. Okay, you can always bring the guy over here. You can always bring outside. Because x is a constant. It will not change over time. It will not change in your problem. Because if the point P stays there all the time, and the ring stays there all the time. And then your a is also a constant. It is just remain as it is. It is not shrinking or what. So it is a constant. The entire integrand is a constant. So you are left with a simple integral, which looks like this. Uh, K lambda over x squared plus a squared. And then the integral of ds over the entire circle. When I do the uh, circle here, it means that you evaluate the integral over the entire circumference. So that's how we denote that. So, of course, if you do this, so you know the length of that section is given by ds. So, how about the entire circumference? The entire circumference is 2 pi a. So, the guy over here, so the term over here, the integral uh, term, is given by 2 pi a. Because a is the radius, so the length of the ring is given by 2 pi a, or the circumference. So, you will end up with this. K lambda over x squared plus a squared times 2 pi a. Okay, so this is the final answer of your VP.
But if you've been provided with the value of the charge, let's say you know that the entire ring has a charge of positive Q. Then what you do, you know that your charge density is lambda, and then you have to mul you have to multiply with the entire circumference. So lambda times two pi a is given by Q. Q positive Q. If you know the charge of that ring, let's say if the information only have um, the, the lambda, then you just put that. Okay. If you know the charge, then you put Q. So that's the idea. Okay. Okay. Let me do a linear uh, situation. Let's say if I have a strip like that, it is a strip. So the area is given by the thickness of the strip, which is uh, dy. Okay. And then this is the length of the strip, right? So L. Is that okay? So the area of the strip is given by L times dy because the because the because the thickness of the strip is infinite uh, is infinitesimally small okay do you get the idea are you sure H how many of you cannot understand this i think this is pretty basic but it's, but the thing is we are using dy you have to multiply the height with the base you no know, with the length length multiplied by the thickness so that you get the area of the strip so the area is given by ds like that. So S is the area. I'm not going to make you confused with A because here I'm using A already. So DS. Or we can also use D um, capital A if you wish, just to avoid confusion. Let's say if I add another strip and then another strip of the same thickness, even more and more and more and more. So uh, these strips will form a rectangle. Am I right? Yeah, so same goes, so the area of the rectangle is given by the integral of the entire thing, yeah? So this is the area of uh, the rectangle. So using the same concept, okay, using the same concept, so now we have a straight strip, but imagine that we have a ring strip like this. So you have another version, which is which is another ring, which is smaller. Okay, let's say if I do the circle here, okay, and then I have my a strip like this. Okay, okay, it, it will form the ring, and then if I add another smaller ring inside, then I am forming a, a thicker ring. If I increase the thickness of the ring by adding the uh, infinitesimal uh, area, because one ring will give you an area of dA, and then another ring will give you an area of dA, and then this ring will give you the area of dA. So if you sum up all of the areas, okay, I have another dA inside. Uh, we are using the previous example, but the previous example, the integral, is just a simple one. Okay, because of the geometry itself is a, is a ring. But now we have a disk. So we form the disk by using the same ring, but instead of having the, ri the same size, uh, the ring, sorry, instead of having a ring of the same size, like the previous example, now we have many, many, many rings, but uh, each ring will have the different uh, radius. I mean, such that they are smaller, 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 smaller. And then when you, um, I don't know how to say this, if you put them together, they will form the disk. Okay like this okay so if you get the idea we can proceed okay we can proceed just like the strip just now the area imposed by the ring okay the area imposed by the ring is given by okay da of the ring is given by 2 pi a uh, uh, lowercase a because uh, lowercase a is the radius okay so this is equivalent to the length just now Okay, equivalent to the length, because the, let's say if you bend the strip and then you form um, a circle, then the length of the strip, the length of the original strip will become the circumference. Am I right? If you bend my hand, becoming a circle, then the length of my hand will become the circumference. Right? So this is your L and then DA. Do you know the reason why I have my DA? Because if, if you could imagine this, if you bend the strip, the thickness of the strip is given by a small change in the radius. Can you imagine that? How many of you cannot imagine this? 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm testing your IQ. Uh, can you uh, imagine this? I have a strip. And then I, so the thickness of the strip is DA. Now I change already. Just now I've used DY, but now I change to DA so that you can understand this. This is my length. And then I bend the strip here so that it will become uh, like this. So the circumference will be L, right? Are you sure? Could you help me giving some feedback so that I can know whether you get this right or wrong? Okay? Okay. How about the thickness of the ring here? So the thickness is given by DA. So the thickness is DA. The A is the lowercase a, not the uppercase. The uppercase a is, is the area. So the ring here will contribute to a small amount of area, DA. Okay? DA. So how do you find out DA? It is basically simple. You have DA equals to L D lowercase a. Okay? I'll show you the reason why I'm using the lowercase a here. So now you know that L is given by 2 pi a because it is uh, it is the circumference of the ring so you replace this with 2 pi a okay the reason why i'm using da which is the small change in the radius it is because the small change of the radius is equ is equivalent to this one you know do, do, do you get it yeah so if i want to if i want to sum up I want to sum all of the contributions. Let's say if I have another ring, which is of the, a smaller size, because later I will assemble them. I put them here. I put this one over here, and then I, maybe I put this one somewhere uh, in the middle so that they will form the disk. So now my integral should be with respect to the radius of the disk. Let's say if the disk, this one, the disk, has a radius of A. So uh, this is the, the disk, yeah? Disk. Let me draw this for you. This is the disk. So the disk with the radius A. So the, 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 the radius of the disk is given by R. Okay, A is a variable, which is uh, the radius itself. But R is the, the total radius. Do you see what I mean? The, the total radius of the whole disk. But A is a variable. It, A is a variable that denote the, uh, the distance from here to any point somewhere uh, here to here, okay? R, the uppercase R is the full radius of the disk. So I have a length over here. I have, sorry, I have a dotted line here, just like the previous one. And then I'm interested to know the voltage at this point due to the disk. So I'm using this one, this example, and then I, I extend the mathematical uh, form so that I can derive the, 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 elect sorry, the potential due to a disk instead of the potential due to a ring. So the potential here is given by um, the same integral over here. So I'm going to remove this, okay? Or do you want me to keep it? I'll just keep it. So, uh, okay, now I'm going to use another font color, maybe uh, blue. Okay, now the potential at point P over here, this potential is given by K, the integral of dQ over R. Am I right? So your R is basically the same, like this one. This is your R. This is your R1. Let's say if I have a smaller disc, sorry, if I have a smaller ring, then your R will be different over here. And then your R will also be different over here. If you make it, make the ring even more smaller, smaller and smaller, then your R will, your, 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 the value of R will be like that. Closer, closer and closer. So that is the idea. Now you have uh, your, the, um, your integral over here. So your dq, so let's say if the charge density of the disk is sigma, then dq is given by sigma dA, this one. So sigma is the charge density of the disk. But this one, I'm, I'm using lambda because it is linear, because it is a ring rather than an area. Okay? Rather than an area, it is, it is a ring. But this one is the area, you know, it is a two-dimensional body. So meaning to say, I'm going to use sigma as my charge density. So I know that my dq is given by sigma dA, and then I know that my dA is given by 2 pi uh, lowercase a, 
um, D A, D uh, lowercase A over here. And then I substitute into this one. Then you will have DQ equals to sigma times 2 pi A D A. Am I right? So now for this particular case, even though your R is changing as you move from here into uh, to the smaller ring, okay? But the thing is, you will have the same um, form here. So let's say now I, I, sub I substitute my R as the, uh, using the Pythagoras theorem. Now I have my X squared plus A squared. You take the square root of that. And then you know that your DQ is this one, and then you substitute into here. So it will be sigma 2 pi a d a. But you know that your radius is not a, con it's not a constant. It is now a variable, okay? Because you want to make it smaller, smaller, smaller. So smaller ring will have a smaller value of a. So it is uh, a variable now. It is not a constant. But x is a constant. So now you cannot bring the integrand outside like the previous one, okay? Now you have to consider the square root of x squared plus a squared. So because, because a is not a constant. So how do you evaluate this? So your a should be from a equals to zero, a equals to zero. So it begins from the center towards a equals to r. r is the radius of the whole disk, okay? But a is the radius of the rings, the rings with f. There are many rings. So this ring will have a specific value of a. A smaller ring will have a specific value of a, which is different from the from the larger one. So you have a smaller one, and then you have a, even a smaller one, another smaller one, another smaller one, so you have a A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, and so on, until you reach to the point where it is at the center, exactly at the center of the disk. Well, you just evaluate this, you go back to your calculus, and then you will find that you can bring K outside, sigma outside, pi outside, and then you are left with the integral of 2A over X squared plus A squared, dA, and then you are integrating this from the center, which is radius equals to zero towards uh, towards the um, the outer circumference of the uh, the disk, which is a equals to r uppercase r. The answer is given by because you have to remember how to do this. You know that uh, if you differentiate the term uh, inside the square root, you will have two a. If you differentiate the term inside the square root with, res with respect to a, you will get 2a. So here you have 2a, then it is just um, the square root of x squared plus a squared. And then you evaluate the integral from a to uh, equals to 0 to a equals to r.